Protect your brand, product, or invention from the hazards of consumer product launching and go from idea to product to big brand with guidance from retail product design and development experts Tracy and Tom Hazard. Get the insider secrets to put the right things in the right order with the right resources so you can out-design, outsource, and out-profit your way to retail success. Hey, product launchers. Welcome to another episode. I've got a great guest for you today. I like to mix it up, of course, and bring you in different people from different areas and different walks of life. And I've got sports marketing coming here. So I've got a guy who's an expert. Dave Meltzer is the CEO of Sports One Marketing. He's a top keynote speaker, award-winning humanitarian, two-time national best-selling author, 25 years of experience as an entrepreneur and an expert in legal technology, sports, entertainment fields. And he's uniquely positioned as a world-renowned thought leader, business strategist, and leading humanitarian. Uh, Dave uses his principles for business and life, gratitude, empathy, accountability, and effective communication to help everyone from college students to C-suite executives to top sports athletes to effectively live by the mission, make a lot of money, help a lot of people, and have a lot of fun. Dave, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to talking about products and products as content and personalization of brands and love to help however I can. Yeah. So we were talking before and and that's what I kind of want to frame up for everyone that sports marketing, sports in general, um, business in general has just gotten so much more personal than ever before. And it's that balance of lifestyle and personal that you've blended really well and, and you've managed to use that in business and not just your own personal brand. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I ran the most notable sports agency in the world called Lee Steinberg Sports and Entertainment and had great brands like Warren Moon, uh, Troy Aikman, Steve Young, Evander Holyfield, Oscar De La Hoya, just great, unbelievable brands in a traditional sense. Uh, understanding how a brand is built is so important. But I really stem back to Shakespeare, uh, who in As You Like It said, the world is your stage. And more than ever, what has occurred is that the world product-wise, and product is really content. Uh, it, it really is. So it's a, either a materialized content of an item or content could be a product of a person. Uh, it could also be an idea. You know, Mickey Mouse, I always say, is one of those great ideas that has transformed itself. But over the last, I would say, especially three years, what I realized was Shakespeare more than ever was correct. That the whole world is the stage, which means if the whole world is a stage, not just the football field, the baseball field, the basketball court or the hockey rink, but if the whole world was the stage, that made me a celebrity, a brand. That's and right. that made all the products that I use important as well. And so I realized there had to be three things uh, to do uh, that we could do in person, on the phone, email, but also radio, print, TV, and most importantly, social media. So what does that mean? Number one, most important thing is you have to have content that has a frequency, just like your product has to have a frequency. I'll give you an example. Diva Curl is one of the products that I believe is an indie product that 10 years ago could never have existed because they could not have reached the market in an effective, efficient, and economical way. So Diva Curl is a hair product that's specifically made for, you know, curly hair people. And in the past, you couldn't just put up a store in Orange County for curly hair people, uh, or it would also be very difficult to build out the brand and have enough investment to go nationwide with one product. But now, because you can capture that product Amplify it and and then perpetuate it. We now can create a brand for a diva curl person. And although there's 4 billion people and growing on the internet, that that great content, that great product now can get the exposure and we can target the specific audience of women and men who have that type of hair and actually be exponentially more profitable from it. So as far as product launch or content launch goes, it doesn't matter. You could have a frequency like Dave Meltzer or a freak like Dave Meltzer, who's a sports executive, philanthropist, speaker, author, keynote, and business coach. But specifically, I capture myself 
amplify it and perpetuate it the same way I did in the old days when I was CEO of Samsung's first smartphone, right? That was a product that we had to educate the market, capture it, amplify it, and perpetuate it. But the only ways to do it back then was in stores, in person, via email, uh, phones. We used print, radio, TV to show people those things. Now we still do those things. Remember, we still do them, but now we amplify it with social media. Yeah. And so, you know, the difference, the past in sports marketing was so different. Like I, you know, I used to work on that early on um, in my career as well. So, you know, 20, you and I have had probably the same length career here. And so, you know, you so much younger. <laughs> I, I'm not, I'm really not. It's been 27 years of product design and practice. So it's been long enough, but yeah, you know, I mean, just looking at that and thinking about what we would do before, it was like, it was a lot more about, you know, licensing and, and it was all about taking the sports celebrity and just putting them on to something or, you know, sticking hats on them. And now it's so different. Now it's really about like, does this fit their life? Does this fit the audience? And there's so much thought and, and difference making going on here. And I really think the tipping point, I mean, this is my personal view on it, was really the Foreman Grill. Because Probably. I think that that, you know, it fit him so well. George it was authentic. It was authentic. And when people saw that, and then it, it went like, you know, wildfire at that stage because it was just so, it caught on because it was so authentic. And that matched to the people who liked him, the people who got him, the people who understood him. And his lifestyle was such a good fit. Yeah, I think there's six components in where the Foreman Grill, which was absolutely one of those kind of turning point items or products, there's six things that we have to look at. One, credibility, and George Foreman had great credibility about eating uh, because not only was he a world champ, world renowned, but he also was known for you know his physique in loving to eat. Two was the emotional connection, and a lot of people don't believe really focus on this and you know through content i believe it's the most important side because people buy on emotion for logical reasons so they really want to feel connected and so you know george foreman obviously connected to so many and he was so just lovable uh and then you look at what would be the reasons quantitatively that i would use the george foreman you know uh press or whatever you know his, his it's grill. features and benefits yeah exactly the impact that it would have on my life and then the capabilities that the grill had. And so if you looked at the credibility of George Foreman, the emotional attachment, the reasons, impacts, and capabilities, when he asked you to buy it, most people couldn't see any reason why they wouldn't buy it. And so that's why it was so successful. I joke around, but you know, most people look at the Pet Rock as one of the dumbest product launches of all time. And don't we all wish we would have thought of it? Um, and, and the reasons that it's successful is to understand why the Pet Rock was successful is it's not as dumb as it per is perceived to be quantitatively. Uh, people are emotionally attached to their pet, so they lock in the most important thing why you would buy it is because people buy on emotion for logical reasons. So then what are the logical reasons to buy a Pet Rock? Well, number one, you can take that pet anywhere. You can fly with it, drive with it, train with it. You can have various sizes and colors and customize your pet. It doesn't, you know, pee on your floor or poo on your shoes or eat your shoes or ruin anything. It's a very inexpensive pet. And most importantly, it'll never get sick, never die, and it'll be with you your entire lifetime and beyond. So emotionally, the pet rock obviously makes sense, but the reasons to buy one were extraordinary. And that's why so many people bought the pet rock. But we don't look at it in that way. I look at things with those six criteria. Does it emotionally attach to someone? And is there a quantitative analysis where I can't see any reason why somebody would buy it? If you go through that, you can even launch a product like Dave Meltzer that is focused in on that. And have millions of people watch my TV show, my podcast, you know, and here's the irony of it, right? When you build that brand, people want you to sell their brand. But, you know, one of my frequencies or authentic being is I don't sell anything except for inspiration. And I believe in the fact and put faith in the fact that if I can inspire others, the universe itself will bring business to me. And I think that's why I do have best selling books. That's why people want me to speak and want me to coach them is because of well, that and, authentic side. And you have that. So the one little thing. So when I, when I talk about emotional connection to products, like if you can make people laugh on top of it, which George Foreman was great at, which in a way the pet rock is, because 
I yeah. tried giving it to my five-year-old and, and nine-year-old and they flipped out and said, this is not a real dog mom, but I thought it was funny and you know, that doesn't work. So, you know, when yeah. you get the humor in something, whatever that is, and you know, that's what you're all about having a lot of fun, right? So, you know, that in a personal brand really helps as well. And even if you're not like, slapstick funny but if you can have a sense of humor about it that always really works well and resonates um, yeah, i think illumination as well as authenticity a lot of times we don't illuminate uh the weaknesses that can put into a place be a strength so i think vulnerability illumination are all things that people do with brands that make them uh, attached to people emotionally in a greater way. So if we are more accepting of ourselves, forgiving of ourselves, which is why those principles that I teach are so important is that I illuminate a lot of different things that make people feel comfortable. And I make fun of myself and make them laugh. But I also, you know, elevate others to elevate themselves. So I talk not just about what inspires me, but more importantly, how can you live an inspired life? What can value can we bring right. you and so you ask. I, I happen to have one of your books here connected to this <laughs> i've actually had this one a while i i don't remember i, I must have gotten it a few years ago um so this one's been in my in my library for a while um but you know what i loved the the messaging that you have going through that about you know you're making choices every single day by how you spend your time and what you put into that. And those are significant. They, they make a difference and an impact on thousands of lives, maybe around you, um, in your business, and then in, like in your case, in your clients, and then that impacts out millions more maybe. So you know, making those choices to be connected to goodness, connected to the things that bring joy and hope and inspiration into the world is really important. And I think a product that way. Of course, and I think of the product in the context of that with also the activities that they support, right? right. So life is just a myriad of 24 hours of activity. I divide them by activity I get paid for, activity I don't get paid for, because I believe in making a lot of money first so I can help a lot of people and have even more fun. But if we look at a brand in the context of activity, then what do we really want to do? We want to make sure that the brand itself is a productive brand. I mean, it brings value to people. And then also an accessible brand, which means that it's accessible to so many different people, as well as that brand is able to access more and more energy, more and more people, that that brand actually thrives, which in context is, will it excite someone well enough? Will it manage and develop the vision well enough that, you, that they will become salespeople for your brand? Right? They're out there going, oh my God, you got to have Dave Belts on your podcast. Oh, you got to hire him as a speaker. Oh my gosh, you got to go listen and buy this book, whatever it may be. That's true branding and marketing. When you can thrive, where not only does one person purchase or accept your brand, but they are so inspired by the management and development of that brand that they're actually out there selling your brand to other people. Yeah. And, you know, we're seeing a shift in sports marketing. So because there's such a shift in, as you pointed it out, like almost celebrity being, it could be anyone's brand. It, do, it doesn't involve just having a large audience or a big platform because you happen to be on the sports field. So because that's happening, we're also seeing that shift where the sports celebrities are looking at it as, you know, I don't want to just have my name on a hat and a shirt and, you know, and just hawk these things. I want them to have meaning. I want these products to have meaning and I want more direct access. So I don't have to do these crazy licensing deals. I can direct sell myself. I can create my own product line. So I'm seeing a, tip, a tipping point and a trend in that happening right now because the tools of marketing are so accessible as well. Well, it's interesting because one of the secret sauces that I've always used was it was one thing to represent you know, a brand or an athlete or a celebrity. Um, but what I always found most valuable was utilizing them as a bug light, right? As a point or a source of attraction to all of those other opportunities. Is that you now not only can do the normal business, the traditional business that you're capable of doing in the skills, knowledge, and desire that you have, but more importantly, unlike any other time, you yourself can be that bug light. You yourself can attract all the business to your own business. And whether you're, you know, the Lululemon CEO or Spank CEO or whoever it may be, where before we were hiring George Foreman 
and naming our product the George Foreman Grill, now we actually can brand ourselves and have the grill, you know, be named whatever it is that it does. And so it's a really interesting shift and a nuance that not only can we be great leaders, but we can brand ourselves to attract to our own businesses and our own brands. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very different. So you got a new book coming out. I want to talk about that. So Game Time Decision Making, High Scoring Business Strategies from the Biggest Names in Sports. So I'm assuming there's lots of interviews and great stories from sports um, coming, big names in sports coming through here. But Game Time Decision Making, what is that? Well, you know, I've been blessed to make a lot of money twice in my life. I'm the rags to riches, rags to riches story. And what I find most interesting is people ask me, you know, Dave, how the heck did you lose over a hundred million dollars and make it back? Well, I always tell them that it was literally about what I call those game time decision making. That one bad assumption, not decision, one bad assumption can cost you everything that you have. Because normally we make really good decisions based off of the information that we received and the processing of that information, which is an aggregate or an assumption itself. And so if we make one bad assumption, we can have a tragic result. And so what I've done is take the greatest athletes, celebrities in sports, as well as executives. In fact, Tillman Fertitta, uh, who's the founder with $6,000 credit card, found in Landry's and the Golden Nugget Hotel and casinos, as well as owns the Houston Rockets and is a multi-billionaire with a B. You know, we, uh, he wrote the forward, but we both share a very common philosophy about life is determined upon the decisions that we make. Well, I always say the decisions that we make, those game time decisions are based off of all the assumptions that happened beforehand. And so what this does is elevates people's awareness of different strategies and disciplines that can help them be more efficient, more effective, and statistically successful in all of the decisions that they make. Mm. You know, that's so true here because we talk about this all the time on this podcast and I'm talking to the inventors and product launchers of the world. And when I'm talking to them, you know, they make bad assumptions at the very, very beginning of it, assuming that people will like what they have to sell without checking on that first. So that's our number one flawed assumption that we make. Um, and that's easy to correct, right? It's easy to ask the right people or that you're, you can make a hypothesis that these are the right people and then check against that. So, you know, but being able to do that, but that's really gets in our way of the success. So often you're right. Those, those sort of limiting beliefs we may have, or they are these assumptions that we're making in the process and that we think we know how this works but maybe we don't. And being able to have screen against that is so important. So what are some of these stories like? Yeah, so, you know, I think to that matter and, and getting to those stories in game, why I call it game time decision making, not just strategic decision making, is the time factor. Ah. Uh, right. And, and, and from my own experience, I was CEO of the world's first smartphone, which at the time in 1999 was the, the world's first color Windows CE device. It was named the PC-E phone, right? A combination of a PC and a phone. And it was so interesting because the assumption, it, it, it was the first failure of Samsung in the phone division, which led to the successes of, you know, the, the flip phones that they had and become, becoming the second most uh, successful manufacturer of phones in the world. But at that time, that time, that game time that we were dealing with, it was too early. You know, just like Napster, you know, Sean Parker, you know, I, I always love when people tell you what a failure Sean Parker was with Napster. And I said, well, in some respect, ec- economically he was, but some of the decisions he makes were just bad assumptions of time, yeah. right? And that, you know, nobody's shopping at a Tower Records anymore because Sean Parker figured out, you know, how to monetize music in its digital format and download it. But it was just the wrong time. Yeah. And for, you know, for me as well, I think it's critical not only to understand the assumptions, but the timing. So we talk about game time decision makings and negotiation. One of the stories was, you know, Steve Young uh, with Lee Steinberg was, it was a big conflict at that time because Joe Montana uh, was the golden boy of San Francisco, but yet it was supposed to be Steve Young's time. And there was a whole bunch of negotiations and decisions to be made. And the deal almost fell apart. At two in the morning, Lee and Steve Young were kicked out of the office uh, by uh, you know, Mr. D, Eddie DiBartolo, 
And they were sitting on the curb in the middle of the night and Steve Young was so furious at Lee and almost in tears going, hey man, you screwed that up. You made a horrible decision trying to ask for that much money. I really want to play for the Niners. I want to be in the NFL, not the USFL, blah, 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 blah. And Lee Steinberg looked at him and said, by 7 a.m., if I don't have a deal, just fire me. That's how certain I am that I made the best game time decision. And although in this framework of the next four hours, you may believe that I blew it, just wait and see what happens. And Lee, having more situational knowledge and experience as an agent than Steve Young as a player, by 7 a.m., they had the biggest uh, and most highest uh, paid contract for a quarterback ever. And Steve Young went on to be MVP of the Super Bowl and win multiple Super Bowls. But game time decisions make, you know, you need situation knowledge and experience and help. And a lot of times what seems obvious in the present uh, is not the right decision. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's so interesting because you also point out something that we talk about all the time on the podcast here and in my column is really that there is also a deep knowledge that's required when you need to make speed decisions. So when you have to make decisions and you, or you have a deadline and a timing, like I have to be in mar at market in, you know, in six months because otherwise I miss the biggest shopping, you know, quarter of the year. And then, you know, I'm not going to do it. You can't afford to make the mistakes of not having deep knowledge and understanding. And that's where you need an expert on your side. Like you were referring to with Lee here. That's Absolutely. sometimes your most critical and important decision you can make. Yeah, because you can buy experience and situational yeah. knowledge and have it partner with you. And I always tell people the most critical question that you have to have in your arsenal to be successful is, do you know anyone that can help me or anything that can help me? And it takes radical humility to ask for help because even the people that are the experts in their own fields, the people that have great experience and situational knowledge may not know anything about what we're doing or you need to know about. And I use that example when I got out of law school. I asked my mom, who is an expert educator, right? She raised six kids, all of them went to the Ivy Leagues, except for the low end here. But more <laughs> importantly, was a tremendous educator, a second grade teacher, later on a principal. And so I asked her after law school, you know, should I be a real lawyer and take this job as a litigator or should I sell legal research online without blinking? And with her experience and situational knowledge, she said, you need to be a real lawyer because the internet's going to be a fad. Um, <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> meanwhile, um, you know, the internet is not a fad. And if I would have made the decision not to get into the internet and sell in the internet, I would have been a millionaire nine months out of law school. Um, so I picked the wrong mentor to ask, right? So we always have to pick people that sit in the situation or have the experience that we're looking for. And, you know, take a quarterback, for example, uh, is a great example in game time decision making. The reason that they can process so quickly on where to throw the football <laughs> is because of practice, right? It's situation. They have to, yeah. <laughs> they, you can't just get out your very first time. I don't care how strong of an arm you have, you will not be able complete a pass in the NFL ever unless you practice, unless you've seen it before. And so that's what we're always looking for in the decision-making process is the right mentor, situation, knowledge, skills, and desire, right? Because desire is necessary for the right decisions as well. Yeah. Fascinating. Well, Dave, do you have some advice for our product launchers out there? Anything that they should be doing, should be thinking about, things that you've seen go really wrong? Because we like to talk about the product launch hazards. We like to talk about I those risks, it. right? The, the yeah, number, one, number one product launch hazard. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Don't be in love with your product. What happens Thank is- you for saying that. You're people right. are so passionate. Right? They forget. Look, if it, wasn't, if it wasn't about money, it would just be called busy right? It'd be called busy, not busyness, right? So it's about making money and you cannot be in love with your product. Your product is about profitability, then purpose, which makes it all the better. And then you can be passionate about the profit and the purpose of your product. Do not be in love with your product. Your product is about creating a margin and distributing it and amplifying it and perpetuating it in as many places And not a you. So if you need ages and it needs to evolve, then allow that to happen. If people are willing to give you a certain amount of profit for it, take the profit. Don't wait and think that somehow that product that you're in love with could never be sold for just that. So don't be in love with your product. I love that last piece of advice because I can't tell you how many times that 
our success has happened in our products because we took the deal. Like we, you know, we did, we looked at that and we said, a deal now is so much better because the market shift is so strong in retail. And that's the area that I usually practice in. It's so strong that you don't know what's going to come tomorrow. And holding out is a huge mistake. I have, I, I've tried that too. So, you know, we see it happen. Take the field goal, you know, t- on fourth down game time decision making, right? The game will be different tomorrow. So go ahead, you'll evolve and you'll be able to create profit tomorrow. But take the deal if it's fair. Three criteria of understanding whether to take the deal. Number one, never negotiate to the last penny. Two, always be fair. And three, don't do business with jerks. <laughs> I'm going to end it there, Dave, because that is just awesome, awesome advice. Thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I look forward to being on again and hopefully seeing you sooner than a few years, okay? That's right, yeah, because we live in the same town, guys. I don't know if all of you are on this, on this Thank episode. Thank God for the internet. I, get I to know, see you. we get to see each other here. But, you know, product launchers, if you'd like to read more about Dave, because this is going to be a future article in Inc. as as we go forward, that'll be linked in the in the show notes for this blog and the blog post for this episode. So be sure to tune in there. And thanks again, Dave. We'll talk again soon. This has been Tracy Hazard on Product Launch Hazards. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Product Launch Hazards. To get the most out of your membership, visit productlaunchhazards.com to join the expert office hours live and ask us your burning questions. Check out the resource library for document templates and guides and get exclusive articles and shares each day. Don't forget, you can always book a private consult with any expert so you can out-design, outsource, and out-profit your way to product launch success.